Oh, uh, so I think we're live. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us in our Think Global today. Uh, so for those online, thanks for joining online as well. Uh, we're going to have a very nice session today, I hope. Uh, the session title is The Disappearing Amazon, Existential, Exist, Existential Threats to a Way of Life. And we've assembled a very interesting panel with folks here in person from our own group. And our colleagues online uh, uh, calling us directly from Brazil, which will be able to share their uh, experiences working uh, with the Amazon in the space of the, how the forest and the dynamics are being impacted by different uh, uh, different factors. So as we go forward, I just want to remind everybody here and online that this session is being recorded and it will be posted publicly. Um, and that if you, this is supposed to be an open, uh, an open question session. So I will invite you to ask questions to the panel. And as a concept, the panel here has different experience and work in different fields, as you will see. And what we're trying to find here is really the uh, intersectionalities of how these changes in the Amazon are impacting different aspects of culture lives as we've seen. So for those online, please feel free to ask your questions on the Q&A channel. Those questions will show up for me or for Caitlin here, who's helping me manage. And for those on here, please just raise your hand and let's get some questions. I've had questions of my own to the group. So as a little bit of a starter, I'm just going to introduce the topic and show you some pictures to kind of give you a context of what is it that we're gonna to try to cover? Uh, and so when we think about the Amazon, there is a lot of discussions around what's going on with the Amazon, along with what's happening in other areas of the world that are being impacted by different changes, climate changes or global changes as an extent. For those that are not fully aware, this is where the Amazon sits. So this is uh, South America. And the Amazon covers the majority of the northern part of the South America, spanning from eight different countries, the majority of it is located in Brazil. It covers uh, about nine different states, but it covers a large portion of Peru and Bolivia as well, and has a presence in all of these other countries, as you can see here, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and so forth. So it's a very, very big area. It's a very important area for the uh, ecosystem dynamics of this entire continent and, and the world. The Amazon itself uh, is also a very, very importantly known for its massive biodiversity. So to some data from the Brazilian Biodiversity Information System show that there's uh, 115,000, over 115,000 different species of animals discovered uh, and, uh, and over 47,000 species of flora and fungi also mapped out and discovered in this space. And that's estimated to be 70% of the biodiversity. There's a lot more to identify. Some estimates show that the Amazon covers about 15 to 20 percent of the global uh, biodiversity. Um, and other estimates suggest that 700 new animal species are discovered annually in that setting. And it covers a lot of the global freshwater as well. But what we've been seeing in the past years is that several threats to the environment have been tackling in this space. And it comes to the development of this, uh, uh, this understanding, not a theory, but an understanding that the Amazon might be facing a tipping point. In the environmental side of, in, uh, of this discussion, the tipping point would be a moment where these threats would change enough of the uh, equilibrium or the uh, flow of the dynamics of the forest, especially around its humidity and water flows, that the forest would change its structure from a rainforest to something else. These threats could be deforestation done by fires or by the advancements of agricultural products, especially soy in the Brazil side, for gold mining, legal or illegal. And it's been dealing with several kinds of different disasters like droughts or fires and other uh, impacts. A very recent paper uh, that came out this year kind of forecasts what kind of different uh, transitions that uh, would eventually happen over the years. Um, and discussions are coming around now that we have two years to save the Amazon. There's debate on 
what that number is, how fast and how far and how drastic this change is, but it's pretty constant that the change is happening. And these discussions are that depending on the type of water, uh, depending on the type of impact from this water flow or the dynamics of the forest, we could be see, we could be seeing different impacts of areas becoming more like a white sand savanna, other areas becoming more concept of a degraded open canopy or degraded forest overall. It's our estimates, our plans, but that this change is happening. And a lot of this discussion also on the same paper uh, shows how this change is impacting the entirety of the space. There's a bunch of maps here. I don't want you to fully understand all this map in the small time that I have to present. I just want you to see some data and believe what I'm saying. <laughs> and always read the paper. But I just want to point a few things here. So all the maps show basically the changes in the temperature on panel A, and it's really showing that there's a, a widespread of uh, uh, temperature rises in these areas. Well, also on map C, I want to show the number of extreme drought events that have also been increasing and more centrally in the forest and not so peripherally where we're used to see the deforestation and the fires happening. On map D here in the bottom, in the uh, first map of the second line there, you can see the intrusion of progress to the forest. These are roadways. And along with the roadways, you can see the small, the red dots that are just showing where the fires are happening, which is really following progress to that definition. Uh, and then the last map, last map F, uh, you can just show as estimated in the study, the potential tipping, uh, the tipping potential of the Amazon. So areas that are gonna potentially change in the next years. So you can see that it's widely widespread in the Amazon and that has, drastic impacts to the environment, has drastic impacts to uh, just livelihood over there and to communities, which is by essence, a health and a, humanity, a humanitarianism problem. Map E kind of gives me a little bit of hope in this drastic scenario. Map E is showing areas of indigenous territories, which are also tied to areas of protection and areas of preservation. These people that habit these locations, different types of groups of populations that are inherent and have built their livelihoods out of their interaction, and per se a sustainable interaction with this environment, are going to be impacted drastically. And that's part of the equation that is not as widely discussed, although it is discussed. And that's what we're trying to bring attention here. A small example, this is from a study I was part of with colleagues that looked at the Shingu uh, ethnicity with the Kuikuru people, which is down in the southern border of the Amazon in the Brazilian side, basically shows that this is the area, the first map shows the area of the Shingu uh, reservation area and how this area has been impacted by deforestation, all the red as dots here and also fires, all the red areas around here, it has been shrinking the entire area to a small area that is keep, it's kept there by a lot of, uh, uh, by a strong presence of these indigenous groups with advocacy and fighting for that space. So that brings me back to my last comment before I open to the panel, that there might be some areas and some ways to address these changes that seem to be something we're gonna have a hard time stopping. And part of it, in my perception, goes into working with communities that are in these sites, in these locations. And some estimates, as you can see here in this figure, shows that the areas where there's less degradation, disturbance of deforestation are also areas that are covered by indigenous territories and protected natural areas. So, I wanted to bring this out for some food of thought before I jumped in, into our panel, which are people that are much, much smarter than me in this topic. And I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, then ask them to do some opening statements, maybe to contradict what I said or to fix anything that I said wrong, which is also fine. Uh, and then we have a very interesting panel here. So I'll start with my uh, colleagues joining from Brazil. They are represented here by Dr. Felipe Murta, who is a researcher at the uh, Tropical Medicine Foundation, uh, Dr. Heitor Vieira Dourado, FMT, and also from 
Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, Theo Cruz, uh, and other areas that he works a lot. Uh, and he's the lead of the Interdisciplinary Laboratory for Social and Qualitative Research, Lee Pesky, at the same site. Um, and also Alicia Cacao, who is a doctoral candidate working with Dr. Muta uh, in the area of tropical infectious diseases in the State University of Amazonas, uh, in partnership with FMT and works with qualitative research focused on uh, community engagement um, in that area. Here in person with me, I have Dr. Bill Pan, uh, closest to me here in the table. He's a professor of global environmental health at Duke University, has a joint appointment at DJI, the Nuclear School of Environment, uh, and has a lot of other things that I will not be able to make sure to, so I invite everybody to come and see the resume, because if I share the resume of everybody, we'll spend an hour. Uh, also have here by Dr. Penn's side, uh, Dr. Gustavo Furtado, who's an associate professor of romance studies in cinematic arts uh, at Duke. And he's been the lead for the past three years of the Amazon lab in the School of Humanities. And also, please see his bio. And then finally, Dr. Brian McAdoo, an associate professor, professor of Earth and Climate Sciences at Duke University, Nicholas School of the Environment, where he studies disasters triggered by natural hazards. And I've been pulling him more and more to the Amazon and to Brazil as we go. Uh, so this is our panel. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts. And I'll start by asking my colleagues here in the ground, let's start with you, Bill, to make some small remarks. Two minutes remarks, please. <laughs> so we can have open for questions about the tipping point of the Amazon and how that's been related to your work. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for organizing, Joao. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I, I had two quick questions before I do the intro. I'm wondering how many people have actually been to the Amazon or South America? And how many people have heard of the concept of the tipping point? Oh, awesome. That's great. Um, that means I don't, that but totally canceled some things I was going to say. <laughs> right. uh, I had expected not a lot of people to hear about what a global tipping point is, but I, I did just want to say with the tipping points that Joao mentioned, um, one of the things that we really worry about is that the Amazon itself is called a global tipping point, which means that if it degrades, it can cause a collapse of other global tipping points around the world, which changes the Earth system. And it drastically changes the environment. Uh, the work that I do, I work mostly in Peru, Ecuador, and some parts of Brazil. Uh, I do work on malaria and climate change. I do work on artisanal small scale gold mining and mercury exposure. Um, we have cohort studies, in different regions of the Peruvian and Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, we have, and that's on gold mining, and we have <coughs> projects where we work uh, very closely with indigenous. Uh, both in mining and on malaria um, in Peru, Ecuador, and Brazil. I'm happy to talk about any of that work. Um, and if you've been to the Amazon and you want to go again and you want to come and visit one of our study sites, you're more than welcome to come. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Bill. Gustavo. Really hard to say only a couple of things. Right? Yeah, I have uh, uh, to stop. Uh, as, the, as the humanist, uh, among scientists, I, I think that there is an element here about thinking of worlds and ends of world, right? Uh, I have kids too, so the apocalyptic sense of our time is quite present for me. Uh, and, and I think when we talk about tipping points and, and the magnitude of our climate, climate crisis, and we think about you know, people in the Amazon, we are, in a sense, speaking about an apocalyptic scenario. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to think of what that means culturally, how we think of end of times and end of worlds, and how different people might think of those terms as well, to give one kind of sense of how this can be made interesting from a, a, a human perspective. You could think that for indigenous people, the world ended in 1500. Uh, and and uh, here I'm not inventing this idea. I mean, indigenous people themselves have pointed that out. Uh, and by that, we don't mean that they disappeared or stopped existing at all. Because in fact, the one thing that has been most common in the history of how we talk about indigenous people is that we say we disappeared. That started happening in 1500 when uh, 
uh, when the, the, the Portuguese arrived in Brazil, they saw people that were soon going to become Christians and stop being whatever they were, which was nothing to them, right? Like people in a plain state. And all the way to the present, we've been uh, talking about their disappearance, but they haven't disappeared, right? What they have done is live past the end of the world. Um, so I think there is a, there's a lot that can be said and thought that uh, is not um, data-based, uh, that is not at the level of fact, but has great import for how we position ourselves and how we speak to people about this. Thank you very much. All right, Brian? Don't know how I'm gonna follow that, but uh, <laughs> I'm a geologist, uh, but I'm also a humanist. And, um, my, my trajectory took me from about 20 years ago when there was a disaster that hit in Southeast Asia um, tsunami hit there and killed about a quarter of a million people. When you see something like that as part of a UN team, there was the first UN science team to go on the ground to start trying to unravel what happened there. Um, it changes your perspective on how nature and people interact, um, especially with indigenous populations that exist on certain parts of Sumatra where we were. Um, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to start dedicating my career to understanding how we can keep the, the natural disaster, natural hazards from killing as many people as possible. Then five or six years later, um, there's another disaster that killed about a quarter of a million people in Haiti. An earthquake happened there, and there's again links between um, colonization, um, <clears throat> post-colonial evolution of places, and ecologies, and peoples, and histories that is that it led directly, direct line to killing a quarter of a million people in Puerto Rico and Haiti. Um, so following that, I ended up moving to Southeast Asia to be closer to where a lot of the locus of the disasters are. And started working with rainforest communities in Borneo to understand how um, degradation of the forest is actually impacting their health and how protecting the forest there can improve their health and well being. Um, that led to projects in Madagascar and also in Nepal. In Nepal, we see um, evidence of the same thing with road construction, which in some ways brings development, which is a good thing. It can bring sometimes food and fuel and education and other technological resources. At the same time, it also leads to environmental degradation for people who have often relied on the natural environment for their survival. So, as Zhao mentioned, he's been dragging me into um, Brazil. I am one of the people who did not raise their hands because I've never not been to the Amazon yet. I know, but I'll wait for that invitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like two weeks. Invitation one thing. <laughs> Thanks, DTHI. But I'm very much interested in learning um, how we can maintain um, a, a sense of Earth science in this conversation. We're talking about massive planetary changes with climate change, but this this complexity associated with what I'm calling global change in our our lab, and call the Planet Lab, um, where you have this combination of of how people are changing the natural environment and also how um, how to disentangle those, those changes that are caused by humans versus changes in the natural system caused by humans. But I think it's really important to have natural scientists at the table in that conversation as well. Thanks for being here. Okay, Felipe. So, hi, people. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to discuss with you about our uh, perspectives uh, from here. And uh, I can see the, the people, uh, students here, but I imagine more than 30 people there. Ashley told me more than that. And uh, I, we expect here to, to make the discussion and with you and uh, leave some message from here, especially about the riverine population and indigenous people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, do you want to say a few words? Introduce yourself. Introduce the Sorry. Well, Alicia, it's not feel so good. Uh, she's sick. Um, but I can uh, present uh, her data and discuss with you. That's okay. Hope, hope, hope she feels better. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for introducing yourselves in a much better way than I could. Uh, 
And I just wanted to remember, this is supposed to be an open conversation. So if you have questions, ask away. Online, if you have questions also, please ask away. But when Bill asked who knew what the tipping point were, what a tipping point is, we could see people raising hands seen here, but not online. So if anybody has questions around the tipping point and what that means, please ask. Uh, and I also want to uh, remember our panelists that the concept is to be try to find these intersectionalities. So if I pose a question and you think there's an answer you can give from your experience in your studies, please also feel free to jump in. But I, I'm going to start with Bill because I've been discussing Amazon with Bill a lot in the past years. And uh, Bill has come, up, has come up in recent years with a different concept for a tipping point, which I enjoyed a lot. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. So there's environmental tipping points where are very important to understand ecosystems. But as we're bringing this conversation to human health, and we're bringing this conversation to how these changes and these tipping points could also impact more drastically people that are in areas where they need more help. They are in areas that are more drastic to suffer consequences out of this. How does that affect your work in thinking about health systems? So, you know, thanks, Rob, for the question. So, I, you know, I think he's getting at the question of what is a health tipping point. And I think it goes back yes. to what Brian was saying, which is, it's really important to have different people in the room when you talk about science. So one of the things that my team does, uh, we have epidemiologists, we have card carrying climate scientists, we have people who are anthropologists and clinical scientists. We meet every month, we talk about our research and we talk about our problems that we're trying to deal with in our, in, in the various research things that we, we kind of <laughs> uh, are trying to address in the Amazon. And the concept of tipping points, I mean, you, know, you all are very familiar with this, but you know, just to be honest, I knew what a tipping point was, but it, I never really grasped from a climate scientist point of view what a climate tipping point really means until we have these very rich discussions. And then as you kind of peel apart what and how climate scientists approach concepts of of what a climate tipping point is and what the impacts are, then you get into these very detailed discussions about, okay, in the Amazon, we're talking about a tipping point and Joao opened up with some of this about deforestation and climate change, changes in water cycles. But then what does that mean on the ground? Like we're talking with indigenous who are highly impacted by deforestation, not just climate change, but not just deforestation, they're impacted by lack of governance they're impacted by illegal land grabs. They're impacted by a bunch of things that I really probably can't explain and Gustavo can do a much better job of, but there are an, an enormous amount of problems, but the environment is continually to fuel the problems that they, they are experiencing. So as a concrete kind of example, in the arc of deforestation, which if you remember the map that Joao showed, which is kind of the eastern side of Brazil going down into Bolivia and southern Peru, um, typically that's the area where there's a lot of logging, there's a lot of pasture for cattle. Um, on the Bolivian side, it's basically narco traffickers doing land grabs and putting cattle in place to claim land from the indigenous. Um, but in Brazil, there's lots of different drivers that are probably causing that land cover change. But that's driving climate change and it's driving what diseases people are feeling. So in a dry environment, like if you clear the forest and you don't have as much water anymore, malaria is not a problem because there's not a lot of places that malaria can exist. But and when I say malaria, I mean the mosquito that carries malaria in the Amazons. However, Aedes aegypti, which carries dengue, it transmits dengue, transmits Zika, yellow fever, those types of vectors can really proliferate in these drier environments where you've got water pots and people storing water. And so those habitats become nice for those types of vectors. Beyond that, you've got problems with chronic disease. So one of the things that we see in our gold mining site, which was the Eastern edge of the arc of deforestation, 
we had originally hypothesized 10 years ago that dengue and malaria would just explode because that's what happens with most gold mining sites that you see in the Amazon. That didn't happen. You cut me off whenever you want me to stop. I can keep going. But the thing that happened about four years ago, right, right at the turn of COVID, we had gone back on our first trip, Beth Feingold and I, mm -hmm. the person that first started this project in Madre Dios back in 2011, we visited the health centers and we were asking, you know, besides COVID, what is the number one, you know, health worry for the health system in Madre Dios? It was diabetic shock. Mm -hmm. People were having massive problems with diabetes. And we had seen this in our data, not diabetes, but we had seen high rates of obesity. <laughs> less access to water, let more access to like sugar and Western processed foods. Then all of a sudden you kind of fast forward 10 years and there's not a diabetic, uh, there's not a diabetes treatment center in Madridios. Now there is, but that was the number one cause of hospitalization back in 2022, 23. And that transition keeps occurring. So we, and, and I'm not a chronic disease expert, but there will be a massive transition in chronic disease that we're going to see. And, we, um, and that's something that needs to be researching more. And that, that's why I love about the concept, because when you think about the tipping points, a very environmental oriented topic, but I can clearly see that the same structure of thought that we're going to transition how we experience life in some spaces because of these changes that are happening, also are going to move changes to the health system, to the cultural beliefs. So uh, I want to pull you in, Felipe, uh, with the experience that you and Alicia had engaging with communities, initially because you were trying to understand how they were experiencing suffering injuries, uh, especially snake bites, which is an area we're very closely collaborating with. But you ended up noticing that they were very concerned about other things, which led you to do the study you guys were doing during the droughts recently. So how do you feel based on your work that this discussion of a tipping point will also impact the experiences you guys have with the communities? How are they preparing for it? How they're seeing that? Firstly, I need to introduce Alicia. He says here yes. now. Alicia yes. is uh, an indigenous researcher. Uh, she's from Kokama ethnicity, and she works now with uh, riverine population and some indigenous population too in the border uh, from Brazil, uh, Colombia, and Peru. So Tabatinga is a city, a uh, complicated city. We, we have a lot of issue about infectious disease, mosquito transmitted disease. And now we have a auto push fever uh, outbreak right now there. So, but Alicia worked with community engagement, especially, uh, and she will talk about a little bit more about this. But uh, the point, uh, I just uh, put a highlight in a situation, in a point, uh, because I work with uh, gold miners in malaria uh, context, and we have uh, the perception of those people. Yes, the gold miners are... Uh, making problem uh, in, in the environment, but the most of them are poor people, uh, illiterate people, and they are dying too in the middle of the Amazon. So uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, population to discuss, not only indigenous, yes, we, we need to, to discuss about indigenous, about the history, but we need to look for those bad guys too. For example, gold miners, uh, the most of them, they don't know the impact they cause and they are poisoned by mercury, mercury, uh, mercury, John, what is the Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, just to put this point to uh, my, my colleagues here, 
and I pass the words to, to Alicia. Okay. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit about my experience and field work with Rivering in Brazilian Amazon. So before I just start to speak about the impacts impact of the climate change, it's important to understand the relationship between the rivering and the nature, because this is something that is not uh, separated, it's together. They need one uh, each other to survive the, uh, there uh, through the agricultural family or the fishing or the hunting. And this is changing now because here, especially in Amazonas, we are facing uh, uh, several droughts, especially in the last years. We have one, we had one. And this is a little complicated because the river is the, how can I say, the, the main thing in the Amazon because it's uh, uh, like something like us, um, I don't know how to say, <laughs> something supernatural, have a mean. So the river is like the, the element who determines uh, the dynamic lives here. So it's more than, it's more than uh, just something geographic. It's really, really important for the people is the element uh, that determines the dynamic lives. And um, just a minute. <laughs> okay, and she, she's talking about, yeah. uh, we need to understand how the river is very important, yeah. uh, not only a way of transportation or geographic, uh, uh, important, but uh, the river is cultural because people use the river uh, for some practice or religious practice also. She, uh, they, they use the river uh, in the floating, uh, the, the different of seasons, uh, they make some uh, agriculture, uh, for example, the agriculture depends on the floating the river, so uh, so for understand the the climate change and the climate impact, we need to discuss first this perception. How those people understand the river? How those people understand uh, the nature? How they relate it each other? Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I jump in here, please? Yes. Thank you, Felipe. So, uh, and, and just to, to get a, a, a pass on to you. So what you're saying is, we see that these transitions are leading to different epidemiological patterns in these areas. And what you've experienced is, it's really tied to how their livelihoods and how their ancestry is linked to the forest. And those changes then, for what I understand, impose very difficult behavioral changes if we're trying to address healthier habits or how to prevent some of these conditions to emerge. Yeah. Just following on something that Alicia mentioned, um, I mentioned before about how, you know, Banda Aceh in Sumatra was destroyed by a tsunami and Port-au-Prince in Haiti was destroyed by a tsunami. We can have bureaucrats from the United States or from the UN come in and say, this is how you should fix this. But wouldn't it be fantastic to have an exchange of ideas between the leadership of Bandache, who had to deal with all this aid coming in and all the problems that had to exist there, to share that with port au prince Haiti, which is another resource-limited area that was completely destroyed. Now, what Alicia mentioned and Felipe um, accentuated is oftentimes people who live in the communities have the best answers to these solutions. They just don't have the resources to actually evolve these solutions. These areas are complex, just like our own homes here are complex. We rely on natural resources in these areas a little bit more than we do. I mean, I get hungry, I go to the Paris Teeter. These guys <laughs> might go to the to provide natural resources in the forest or in the river. They're, they're intimately connected. So um, to really to understand the complexity of these systems, you've got to understand you know, the first place we always go as a geologist, mind you, in our labs, to talk to the humanists to better understand how do these communicates interact with, how do these 
communities interact with nature? What are their cultural connections to the land? What are their religious connections to the land? What does the land mean to them in terms of not only their provisioning as far as food, but also their, their spiritual provision as well? So that, 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 that pushes me back to what I was going to follow up with Gustavo, uh, that as we talk about tipping points and changes, you, you started your uh, your participation here by sh remembering us that there's been massive cultural impacts and what to say tipping points as Brazil was colonized. Uh, and I'm sure that that's similar to other colonization uh, uh, periods across the world. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm also just bringing to mind discussions we had this past week with one of the Amazon Lab events when we had uh, Mike Hackenberger come and talk about his work that while we change the environment and we see changes in the epidemiological, epidemiological pattern, and those are even fast to an extent, it seems that the changes in the culture and the changes of how these communities will be able to face and engage with this are things that are more tied to long, long history in those areas. So how does these changes will, in, in your uh, experience or in your work, how, how, how is this going to be perceived in terms of the, the legacy, the cultural heritage, and what kind of shocks will that potentially create? I mean, some of this is, I don't want to get too speculative, you know, but uh, uh, when, what I meant before is that, of course, we're facing something that is uh, specific in a sense new and catastrophic right now, but, but dramatic environmental changes have happened to indigenous people before, right? So when you have like massive deforestation, when you have like, a, you know, it's, these are ecological catastrophes, of right? Sort, right? right. And they are occurring unrelated to, 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 to climate change per se, but related to the culture and the economy that creates the climate change, right? So I'm thinking, for instance, of, you know, in, in the state where I'm from, uh, awfully named the General Mines, Minas Gerais, because that's where, you know, there's been a source of ore, was the source of gold and diamonds and but now it's a source, it's a source of iron ore, etc. Uh, you know the the the, the mining dams, right? The, the sort of like the, the the slurry from the the debris of mining. The mining dams are bursting, right? And one of those uh, 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 incidents, crimes, choose your word, right? Killed Giodosi, yes. right? This is not like a climate change event, right? It's 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 tied to extractivism. It's tied to a mindset. It's tied, it's tied to an economic logic, right? Uh, and people live along the Udosi, including indigenous, not only indigenous, but including indigenous people. Like this wonderful one of Brazil's most interesting contemporary thinkers is Ayuton Perenaki, who has been translated. I think these three books are now translated into English, including by one of our collaborators in the lab who translated the, the most recent one. Uh, uh, you know, and, the, and so li life goes on, right? <laughs> Life goes on differently, but it goes on. I, I don't want us to, to keep on, on positing uh, the end of, of indigenous cultures or other cultures, right? Uh, what is more interesting is to think, is to not think in terms that are very Judeo-Christian of like origins and, and ends, but of continuations with difference and survivals and rearrangements. Because I think that's the reality that we're all later than them are going to have to face. Is we're going to have to live different someday, right? And some people are, have mastered how to live differently, you know. So, so I think there is a real uh, chance for, for. I think uh, we need paradigm shifts for thinking about this, and it involves narrative structures, it involves concepts, right? Not just information. And I, and one of the ways that to think about the Amazon Lab, which is a temporary formation, unfortunately, it's a three-year long or a third year. It's going to go on in some form, but not in, you know, we don't have the same footprint. But one of the ways that we have uh, approached our work is by creating very dialogic spaces uh, uh, and events. And I, what I mean by dialogic is uh, we really want to bring people with different kinds of knowledge into a conversation. Uh, and that includes academic and non-academic. Uh, it includes activists and artists, right? It includes traditional knowledge and formal knowledge. 
Uh, so like one of our most recent symposia was titled Counter Cartographies of the Amazon. Again, it's a question that's not directly linked to the environment or to climate change, but it is, right? Because among our guests, we had indigenous uh, uh, lawyers and activists who are uh, working with indigenous territorial rights. And that's directly linked to how much of the Amazon is not going to be cut down, mm -hmm. right? And to the possibility of survival of, of, of some forms of life for at least a significant amount of time before more changes you know, mm -hmm. uh, occur. We brought people who are doing, like this is group called the New Social Cartography Group in Brazil. And what they do is they work with traditional communities, indigenous and non-indigenous, uh, on, on they teach mapping, in effect, teach mapping but teach mapping in a way that, that can be very useful uh, to what people are concerned with. That includes territorial rights, but also organizing knowledge, like things such as, you know, every time the state produces maps, uh, we decide what rivers are called, mm -hmm. right? So we don't remember what the rivers are called in different languages anymore, right? There's an erasure every time every time we, of we, we officially organize the world and, and name things. So, so like they do things like that. They like reorganize so she's environmental you know worlds uh rename it with traditional names etc and some of these people the people who came to our recent event are working in what's called the volta grande do xingu this is like a place that has uh is what came after the construction of belo monte so this is again not like the tipping point no, but but it's directly or it's tied to that, right? It's like one of the great, the large, I think it's the third, maybe largest dam in the world. So, so very. Pelomonchi is a, a hydro plant dam that was built in an area that basically destroyed a whole area. It's a huge controversy. In the yeah. Mexico. So they are working in this region, you know, which is another, this has been happening, right? This has been happening for a long time. But it's like, you know, what happens when you flood a place where, where people have been living? Some of the people who are living there, where people who moved to the Amazon during the rubber boom, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and now they've become forest people. They have they have a very they they've had a very sustainable way of life, very different way of understanding the forest than than states do than we do, right? Uh, they have been displaced, right? So now they become peripheral poor people in their urban cities. Right, so they were they were working with them. So our our, our events and what we hope to keep on doing tend to bring together, you know, uh, and, and I and, and I encourage conversational models. I mean, I go to a lot of conferences and and even give talks that I find it a well, little incomprehensible. We want to have health people there to join this. Yeah. yeah. So yes. I encourage, I encourage presentations that are very accessible, right, so that people can actually have different kinds of knowledge brought on each other and. Uh, and, and back each other. Sorry, I went too long. No, 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 you're fine. Get you're, no, yeah, I think you're bringing the point where uh, we, we, we're trying to go in different levels and different domains of, uh, of uh, knowledge here. And then you can clearly see that there's a distinction on the approach, but we're kind of talking about the same things. And I, I, I love your concept around these communities have just continued living on and have adapted. and, and but that brings challenges to how we can engage with these communities if we're trying to build something from a more macro perspective. One of the questions I have here from one of the attendees, which is kind of what I want to try to get into because one hour will go very fast, is that, right, we're, we're raising a lot of anxiety here. Mm -hmm. And so what is, the, what, what is the step forward? And the question that I have here is if we are aware of have these countries started formalizing ways to address this problem through laws, through coalitions, or anything that you're familiar with? But overall, I think we can start engaging in the conversation of what do we do forward? What is our step forward? I'm not going to answer. <laughs> Anybody want to start? <clears throat> okay, I'll, 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 I'll I can build. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I just have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I do want to recognize one really important point about this panel, because we're talking about indigenous and engaging indigenous. But we're all male up here. Right. And, you know, the other right. thing that we really miss, I think, is a female perspective. I don't know if you But like on our teams, for example, um, you know, I would say that some of the best insights we have on communities are coming from women. 
yeah. and the information we get from women and not just the information we get from women it's the information from women that women translate to men um yeah. that's a that's a really hard thing and it's a uh, and it, I'm a biostatistician so you know communication is not always great but what I can tell you is that uh you know the the way that people interpret information is all different and so you really need to have if you're collecting information from communities especially qualitative information you need to have several people look at that information and translate it so that we can understand it i would say that's number one i'd say number two you know i mean that's from a community you know individual level uh we have a, a bass team that's called the ASGM BAS team, the Artisanal Small Scale Gold Mining BAS team. And we focus right now primarily on uh, Peru, Ecuador, and uh, Guyana. And our team is split into three groups. One is the policy, one is health, and one is the, the geo engineering and geosciences. Uh, basically, Pratt engineering, global health, and then San Francisco policy. So we had a whole discussion yesterday about how do we solve the problem of artisanal small scale gold mining, which we will never solve in our lifetime. But one of the things that the policy group brought to us was that if you look across what formalization of mining means by law in Peru versus Ecuador versus Guyana, and they also had comparisons to some places in Brazil, the law is all very different. So what a miner needs to do to become formalized and address environmental problems in their communities are different. Like if you're in Tabatinga, for example, on that tri-country border of, of Peru, Colombia, and Brazil, you can cross the border and work in Peru and have a very different law that you have to satisfy. And you walk 10 minutes to the east and you have the Brazilian law. Those are all very different. And so the miners and people will take advantage of the fact that laws are different and they're living in a place that's very remote. But there are pathways to solutions in policy. Um, but I think there needs to be, when you, when you do those policies, you have to get lots of people in the room, the miners, the big gold processing companies, the buyers who are actually buying gold and selling it on the market so that everybody understands what a clean supply chain means. And so if you're a formalized miner in Brazil and you sell it on the market, and you are a consumer buying gold, what does it mean that you bought gold in Brazil versus buying gold in Peru versus buying gold in Guyana? All those things are very different. And if you think you're buying green gold, the greenness doesn't, it's not all the same. And so that that's very confusing. And so I think those very in-depth discussions need to begin. Um, and, and you have to start engaging people from different places and talking about how to create policies that are, that are more informed, I think. That's not really an answer, but all I will tell you is that's a big challenge that we're trying to discuss. Right. I think I'm going to set up Gustavo on this. I'd like to look forward to hearing his comments on this one. Um, the work we're doing in the Amazon with a, a, a um, international nonprofit NGO called Health in Harmony um, has a tool they call radical listening. They pose a very simple question to local indigenous communities um, in areas that are being deforested say asking, you know, what would it take for you to stop cutting down the forest? Like, look, we don't want to cut down the forest. We value the resources that come from the forest. We need those resources. However, we also need to survive. Um, the original model they used in Borneo where we were doing work was, um, there's a, a logger, a guy who's doing illegal logging in this protected area who went in and cut down a tree to save his wife who needed an emergency C-section. You know, everybody in the room would do the same thing given, the, given that lack of opportunity. So, um, Health and Harmony does fundraising globally, a lot of the global north, and then delivers resources to provide resources to the solutions that communities come up with. So we go into these communities and they say, what do you need to not cut down the forest? We need health care. So they work and they provide health care based on the kind of um, different diseases or, or challenges that face in the community. They can then support the community. If they have a, a um, agreement to not deforest, they can get free or seriously subsidized health care. Um, they've been in, in Borneo now for about 12 or 13 years. They just started in Brazil um, right at the beginning of COVID and were able to do things like deliver vaccines and, um, and also treatment for COVID in very rural places in the Amazon. So 
going back to, to the, the idea of listening to local communities, they often have the answer. They just don't have the resources. One solution is if you can listen to the solutions they have in the communities, we just need to provide resources and tools to help them build capacity to solve their own problems. That's great. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to move to Felipe uh, and um, if Alicia is there, but uh, so what do you think from your experiences there, what's the way forward? What can we do now to try to tackle this from a perspective of climate change, but also just from a perspective of engaging with healthcare needs from these communities and changes in livelihood? Um, yeah, I, we strongly believe in um, the community surveillance engagement projects, for example, for new, because we, we work with infectious disease. So we hope the new, the, the new pandemic, the new pandemic uh, will be, uh, of course, here, especially in the Amazon. Everyone knows, uh, everyone knows about it now and discuss this. So uh, we need to, uh, to build this knowledge together with these communities. Uh, I agree with my colleague, uh, ap apply the new tools and technology to monitoring for, uh, to uh, empower these people with health, with access to health, access to education, good education, and of course, we need to strengthen our laws and our government's uh, fiscalization, especially in illegal activities like uh, deforestation and gold miners and cattle, uh, pre, uh, cattle pastures, new pastures. So this. Thank you. And I'm, 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 I'm sure you were meaning to say we're, you're expecting the next pandemic coming from uh, the Amazon forest, which makes sense. Uh, we're going to do a few questions here. Yes. Uh, my question goes, aligns a little bit with this policy. I wanted to know how can we uh, hold the developed countries accountable for these global tipping points without falling into the white savior spiral mm -hmm. that can cause like communities know the answer, but if you're gonna provide them, we can we usually go for like, okay, I providing you, I'm saving you. Mm -hmm. And that's not what's happening. So how do we tackle this? By how do this country is uh, accountable without falling into this white savior policy? I'm gonna give you a quick example on this one. Um, in, in the work that Health and Harmony was doing in Brazil, and I don't know how, how public this is, but I'm going to tell the story anyways. Um, you know, this radical listening is interesting because they really do try to empower women to Bill's point to do this because oftentimes men are not so good at listening. Um, one of our, one of the leadership in, in Brazil said, oh, there's a community up the river, they need neonatal vitamins or prenatal vitamins. That'll help their, their um, infant mortality do a lot better. And then leadership from HIH Global, Health and Harmony Global said, well, did the community ask for it? I said, no, he didn't. they didn't. So, so well, they don't get them. So actually truly empowering the radical part of radical listening is really, you have to listen to the solutions they do, no matter what. Um, and it goes down to education, to Bill's point, you know, that, that has a lot to do with, with what they can ask for, what they get. But otherwise, it has to be driven. You have to take that leap of faith with the communities and say, nope. We are going to give you the resources you request to come up with the solution you need and let go of that power. Again, something that we in the West and the global North and in the um, male side of society don't do very well. I don't disagree with that answer. I would just say that, um, you know, I, I think that uh, Latin America in general does a much better job of being empowered from a community level than say, Africa or South Asia. I don't know about South Asia actually, because I don't work that much there, but in the places in Africa I've worked, there is much more of a community saying, hey, give us something from the outside. Versus when you work with a community in Latin America, they're always kind of like, don't come to us. You know, you have to get special permission to even talk to them before 
they accept something. Um, so that that engagement is different. Can I invert the question though? How do we make uh, Europe and the United States accountable for climate change? Mm -hmm. There's something fundamentally colonialistic about the question. You know, how how can people in developing countries be made accountable for this? They're not the, the cause of our crisis. They might be trying to join the party a little mm -hmm. bit, but very late, you know. Uh, so it's it's a fundamentally uh, uh, problematic uh, framework. Uh, and it's also one point about the issue of legality, right? Because a, a lot of what happens in Amazon happens in Italy. Uh, you know, they try to stop the, the gold mining barges that plant them. It's very difficult, right? And uh, a lot of it now is tied to narco traffic. There's an article in The Guardian from yesterday about this in Colombia, how and the, the person skyrocketed this year because of that. But I want to point out that most of what happens that is atrocious happens legally. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are laws that, that encourage people to take possession of land, cut it down, and put cattle on them. Uh, and guess who eats the cattle? You. you all, us, right? So it's not a problem of just localities. It's not that simple. I'm the best in this to do <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so I, I heard a lot about engagement with the community as a key piece. I heard a lot about uh, the problem and trying to understand the problem better. I think there's a lot of just understanding the, this connection of uh, the, the, the different uh, domains in the problem and how to make them talk. And that's really what this panel is about. Uh, but it seems like that, that's still a big challenge uh, that we have to address somehow. And we're trying to do that with multiple groups and teams that have very different expertises, but uh, it, it, they're, they're key pieces of it that are still challenging. And from the questions that I see here and that from see online, which I understand are motivated by the, the, the trying to find a path forward, we're probably missing an advocacy person here to talk more about uh, this legal aspect of facing the problem, uh, which I think is all part of it. I, I do want to say we have five minutes. Uh, and a lot of the questions that we got from online were really around this pessimistic negative space we're in that I think we're very able to cover. So we have a burning question over here. Yes, I'm please. Gonna die. And I think I might get to where you're going. It's, it's, your, it's my last question. It's your last question anyway. So okay. it's the last question we're going to take. So we are. Yes. So Joao's point and uh, Gustavo's pessimism. I want to know from all of you, especially the folks in Brazil, um, what gives you hope? Um, I think there must be some kind of mental tipping point where I withdraw and I don't want to hear the news about climate change. I'm sure many of us have seen the pictures of the dried up river in the Amazon. It's depressing. <laughs> I don't want to engage. So I need to know, what do you see in your work that's giving you hope. That's what I was going to get at. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. It's much, much better for him than I would ever. So, yeah. What gives you all hope? Uh, let, let, um, let me start with sure, so seeing online and give them more time, and then you guys probably would have one line to say. So, <laughs> Felipe and Alicia, you guys are there. What gives you hope? Yeah. Uh, uh, let me see if I understand. Uh, my uh, in ours uh, in our work, we also put some uh, product or a return to our population. So we are, for example, discuss about Alicia project with uh, Riverine empowering, especially about health issues. So we. In our project, we develop a, a little system, a small system of communication, uh, put a simple telephone in this community and try to see how they use this to ask 
for uh, rescue and as for doctors. For, for example, this is one, one of uh, our return to this community. And I think, uh, I, I don't know if I understand, but this is our, this is our way to uh, make a research with some response, some apply uh, technology or whatever simple thing. For example, we are using now an envelope uh, PEPs for malaria treatment because in Brazil, they use, uh, uh, they, they cut the pills and give the people, and especially for illiterate people, they don't understand how needs to take these pills during the week. So we develop a simple technology with uh, uh, different colors for these illiterate people uh, to understand how I need to, uh, uh, how uh, need to take these pills correctly, not uh, and improve the the medication as you use. Yeah. I don't know if this is the, the yeah. good answer. It, it, uh, what I hear from that is that there's this there's work in listening and engaging with the community that can give them direct benefits <clears throat> in how you address those as a part of this bottom up approach dealing with some of these issues. So, as I said, one liner for the three of you here. What gives you hope? Everybody here who's working on this stuff. Mm -hmm. I know it's, it sounds like an excuse. I don't mean to pass the buck on to the younger generation and all that. I think by working together and really making the shifts, learning from what we've learned as, as old heads in this conversation and inspiring you guys to make changes, I really believe we're making the, moving the needle forward. Things are getting better in a lot of places. And I think we can learn from these different places and share learnings and move things forward. To me, there are many things. One of them is that despite all the bleakness that we can point to, there is a, uh, a, a change in how, in who is, who is speaking today, including a lot of women, a lot of indigenous women are, are major leaders in the Amazon. Uh, so there's a real positive change going on in the in, in who is determining how we're going to talk about things. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's our challenge, us here in this room, is to, to get out of our heads and to think from a different point of view to think differently. When, when I started working in the Amazon, which was 1998, um, I remember talking to someone in Lima saying, like, why do you want to work in the Amazon? And this is a Peruvian who never traveled to the Amazon. And as I continued working in Peru and Ecuador, I kept meeting more and more people, never, I mean, it's their own country, never actually traveling to the Amazon and seeing the Amazon. And here I am coming from the United States because I loved going to the Amazon. It was an amazing place. Now when you go, there are so many people engaged in the Amazon locally, not just in Lima and Quito, but kind of like what Gustavo Reiner is saying, there are people locally that are really engaged that want to do work with people that are outside of their communities. And that's, uh, that's pretty amazing, actually. That's a huge change that's occurred in about 15 years. All right. Uh, so, yes, the panel was supposed to raise anxiety, <laughs> and so that you should take all of that and push it towards engaging, because you've seen that that's part of where the solutions. So, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank Felipe and Alicia for being online, and thank everybody for listening. And I hope we can continue this conversation here at DJI and other areas at Duke and elsewhere as well. Thank you.